Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers ambiguous stone artifacts. By the end of this episode, you will be familiar with how these objects were made and used. You should be aware of the range of procedures for describing and analyzing stone artifacts. Based on this knowledge, you can build larger research programs. This presentation concentrates on how to make sense of stone artifacts that often are ambiguous at first glance. They could be broken pieces, discarded waste, complete items, or incomplete portions of multi-part objects. If you can clarify these basic parameters, then you can proceed with logical interpretations and factually based research. A few different approaches can clarify the ambiguities about stone artifacts. Perhaps most fundamentally, you can consider the raw materials and their physical properties. Next, you could look for parallels in reference examples of artifacts, possibly preserved in archaeological sites or documented in known historical contexts. Another approach involves experiments with replica artifacts or computer simulation. Concerning the raw materials of stone artifacts, you can begin with identifying the type of geological formation or even the specific source. Next, you can search for how people obtained the raw material, and then you can assess how the material was processed into a final product. In this approach, you should be aware of the physical properties of the stone in question, noting how those properties affect the potential use. At the summit of Haleakala in Maui, a nearby volcanic crater was the source for making hundreds of stone flakes that cover the ground in numerous localities. The fine-grained basalt was of exceptionally high quality for flaking in predictable shapes, as well as for retaining sharp edges. Oddly enough, nearly all of these basalt flakes had been discarded without any use as tools. In this case, the abundant flaking debris must represent the byproducts from an early stage of the tool making process, and we would need to look elsewhere for the finished tools. Indeed, this high elevation alpine zone cannot support large scale residential settlements, and instead, the archaeological traces here resemble short term and small scale camps for processing the basalt raw material and occasionally for other specialized activities. Typical of workshop sites, the stone flaking debris showed a high degree of uniformity, reflecting a standardized tool-making tradition all across the site. In a larger view, the raw material from Haleakala had been made into finished tools and exported into formal settlement sites at lower elevations and distributed to other islands in some cases. At habitation sites, usually the stone tools show some diversity in their raw materials, as shown here for the site of Unaibaput in the Mariana Islands. You can appreciate how the physical properties affected the intended use. Stones with high silica content tend to be used for making cutting and slicing tools. More porous or coarse-grained stones tend to be more suitable for making pounding or grinding tools. When interpreting how people may have chosen their raw materials for making different categories of artifacts, you should keep in mind about the availability of other options for making tools, for example, using durable shells. After assessing the raw materials of stone artifacts, you still may need more information to ascertain how the objects once had related to complete tools. In this regard, reference examples can be informative, for instance, seen in well-preserved sites, in historical records, in traditional knowledge and practice, and in museum collections. 
In special circumstances, wooden handles and other organic components have been preserved in peat bogs. For instance, flint axe blades have been confirmed with their handles at a number of sites in Denmark. In many parts of the world, collections by foreign visitors and researchers have provided information about wooden handles, twine, and other perishable components that typically are missing from archaeological sites. With these kinds of references, you can acknowledge the larger cultural contexts of the durable stone remnants in archaeological sites. Often, historical documentation overlaps with traditional knowledge and practice. In these circumstances, much more information can support lively reconstructions of how artifact assemblages had been used in the past. Another way to learn about stone tools is through experiments. Many experiments involve replicas using similar raw materials as the stone artifacts. New developments have been possible in computer simulation. Still more possibilities have emerged with microscope examination. In all of these cases, the analysis concentrates on the material-based technical performance of making or using stone tools, but you should remember about the intangible factors such as skill level and social context. Experiments need to account for the amount of force applied, the direction of force, and the resulting patterns. The goal is to make a positive match between the experimental results and the patterns seen in a set of archaeological artifacts. This approach can retrace the manufacturing sequence of flake debris. Equally, it can be applied at a smaller scale for individual artifacts to ascertain further actions of flaking, polishing, or other modifications in order to produce the finished objects. Looking even more closely, you could find microscopic traces on both experimental replicas and on real archaeological specimens. Microscope analysis can reveal the signature markings of polishing, grinding, scraping, and other actions. Sometimes residues are preserved, and they potentially can be matched with known plant taxa or other entities. More experimentation can work with flake debris in reverse order, testing the possibilities of reassembling the pieces backwards through their steps of the tool-making process. When working with experiments, we all need to remember that the artifacts were used in real-life contexts. They were made and used by people with different skill levels, and moreover, they were involved in larger activities. In this museum reconstruction exhibit, you can see how people harvested their grain crops using stone blades. You could explore further questions about the social relationships of people, their different ages and skill levels, and how those variables might be reflected in the archaeological artifacts. As you have seen here, stone flakes and tools often are ambiguous at first, but you can use a number of approaches to clarify what these objects represent. Based on these clarifications, you can develop stronger interpretations and new research programs. In concluding this episode, now you should be prepared to describe and interpret stone artifacts. You can assess the material evidence, and you can organize procedures for collecting information toward addressing significant research issues. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studio.